May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on the earth and your saving power be known amongst all the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples of Brazil praise you. Let the peoples of Thailand and Cambodia praise you. Let the peoples of North Korea and Syria and Afghanistan praise you. Let all the nations be glad and sing for joy to our God and the rock of our salvation. For you judge the peoples with equity and you guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. And God, we pray for that same fear to be released in this place today. That our love, respect, and reverence for you would increase. That our response to you would be worship, love, praise, and obedience. That we would be a people marked by your presence and let that same reverence dwell with your people in this place as we leave this place into the city. God, we ask that you would release your spirit in power during this time. This time where your word will be declared, let it be declared in a way that would honor Christ and be faithful to your word. Let those who hear your word not simply listen, but obey and be changed by it. And Father, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, anoint me, empower me, cleanse me with your blood, and let the spirit of the living God preach through your son today so that all that I think, the motives of my heart, would be pleasing in your sight. God, we give you this time, a sacred time. Lead the way. Guide us into truth and change lives to the glory of the name of Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that you learn about driving in Korea is that the rules are different from what you learn in the classroom. Uh, the longer you drive or are on the streets of Seoul, especially in a taxi, uh, you realize that red does not always mean stop. Green always means go, uh, but yellow usually means speed up. You know? um, and the other thing that I learned is that after midnight, if you're driving in a taxi, uh, the rules don't exist anymore. Um, I, I didn't know that about Korea. 
Um, so many taxi drivers, they hit the hazard light, and somehow that gives you permission to do whatever you want. You know, it's, it's fascinating, the power of the hazard lights in this country. Uh, but, you know, it really made me wonder about uh, what really are the rules this culture is governed by? What do we really submit to? What are the real laws of this country? Uh, and the same question can be applied to the people of this nation as well. What rules do we follow? What rules do you follow? Uh, what governs your life? Uh, what laws do you abide by? Who do you follow? <clears throat> and who does your heart yield to? It's an important question to ask, especially for those who call ourselves followers of Jesus. What does that really mean to follow him? What does it really mean to obey him? What does it really mean to call him Lord? And uh, as we're doing this series on praying for your pastors, I realize that this is an important question even for ministers of the gospel as well. I know some pastors, they love following the latest trends. Uh, so they don't have to pray about what to do for the next series. Uh, the latest curriculum, they're going to buy it. The latest video series, they'll pre-order it and they'll do it regardless of any other factor except that it is newest and most popular. I know of other pastors who change the direction of uh, their ministry or their message uh, depending on what the congregation members will say or complain about. So if they don't like something, it'll be changed. If they suggest something, they're going to do it. And these ministers are pretty miserable because if you are a people-pleasing pastor, uh, you will eventually be miserable because you cannot please everyone. And I also know of some pastors who are governed uh, no longer by a passion for the gospel because after pastoring for several years, uh, they lost a bit of their desire for ministry and so they've taken up new hobbies and new passions like golf. One of my friends told me about his friend who is also a pastor whose life motto throughout his uh, years has always been only the best. And that motto used to apply to ministry, that, oh, I only want to give God the best, give God the best in everything. But as the years went on and as the decades rolled on, suddenly that motto determined his hobbies. And so now he'll use that phrase to determine which golf club he'll buy, only the best, or which golf uh, country club to play in, only the best. And through it all, uh, I realized that it is hard to maintain a heart that is yielded to God throughout the duration of our faith journey. Uh, you know, we begin our Christian life with this desire, but as Jesus mentions in his parables, the worries, the cares, and the toys of this world can often deter us and distract us from truly following Jesus. You see, some people follow the crowds, other people follow the trends, but we are meant to follow Jesus and him alone. We continue our series on how to pray for your pastor, and I'm glad that this is causing more people to begin praying for our pastors, um, which was the intent. And uh, to review, how should we pray for our pastors? We looked at, first of all, the importance to pray for protection. So everyone say protection. All right, so that's one of the most important things to pray for for your spiritual leaders, to really pray for protection. There's a lot of warfare. There's a lot of temptation. There's a lot of things to try to derail ministers from being faithful in their journey. So pray for protection. Also, it is important to pray for rest. So when you repeat, rest. Physical, spiritual, emotional rest, knowing that our souls find rest in God alone. That is important to pray for as well. And last week, we looked at the importance of praying for anointing. So everyone say anointing. Right? That there's a difference when the, a place in a person is experiencing the manifest presence of God in a special way. And today, uh, we'll look at the need to pray for a yielded heart. So everyone repeat, a yielded heart. Okay, so that's what we want to look at. So it's crucial that the shepherd of the flock ultimately follows the shepherd of our souls. 
And that's what we want to be praying for. So follow along with me in your outlines today. And let's continue to grow as intercessors for our pastors who desperately need our prayers. So why should we pray for a yielded heart? Because a yielded heart reveals something deeper about the person. And uh, first of all, it's, it shows that it's a heart transformed by the gospel. So everyone repeat, it's a heart transformed by the gospel. Right? So a heart that delights to do God's will is a heart that's been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is then that you understand that to do God's will delights God's heart. 1 Samuel chapter 5 says, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And so we learn throughout Scripture is that God desires and loves obedience. In fact, in 1 Samuel, we learn that God loves obedience even more than great sacrifices that we can give to God. You see, extra acts of sacrifice do not make up for immediate acts of obedience. We often think, we can make it up to God later, but God desires hearts that follow him today. So we think, God, I'll make it up to you. You know, it's like, I, you know, I'm going to do these things. I know I shouldn't be doing them with my taxes or these other things, and, but God, I'll make it up to you. I will tithe extra money from the money that I am stealing, right? Um, I will go to the retreat next year as long as you just let this go, God. And so we like to compromise and we like to say, God, I'll make it up to you later by these sacrifices when God ultimately desires obedience today. But that's the problem that we face, is that we don't really like to obey. Uh, we are a fallen people in our flesh and we love to break the rules. One garden in the city, a public garden, said that the sign that they had to replace the most was the sign that says, do not touch. And in the first garden as well, the one tree Adam and Eve was told not to eat from became too hard to resist. And the most popular books in certain countries are the ones that are banned. Our flesh is drawn to forbidden fruits. As the hymn declares, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. This is human nature, and this is our sinful nature. And I see this in my two-year-old son as well. As hard as it is to see, I see his flesh getting strong. You know, during bath time, uh, sometimes, you know, the water levels are at a certain height, so it needs to stay there, otherwise it's going to get too high for him. And so sometimes he wants to play with the water faucet, and I'll say, Enoch, don't touch this, okay? And then I see him, he'll look at the faucet, he'll look at me, he'll look at the faucet, look at me and say, Daddy, go outside. Leave, go. And he'll look, look, go. And I say, is it because you want to touch this? Don't touch it. Daddy, go. And so I see the struggle that he is going through as a son of Adam. You know, see, by nature, our flesh does not want to obey. As Romans 15, 19 reveals, uh, For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So the disobedience of the one man, Adam, made us all sinners, because we are seeds of Adam. But in Jesus, the second Adam, the greater Adam, whose obedience to the Father was perfect, it was his obedience that made us all righteous. The desire to obey and the ability to obey are now extensions of grace that comes through faith in Christ. It flows from a heart that has been transformed by the gospel. And the glory of obedience was seen and embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 says, And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So the greatest act of obedience was displayed on the cross of Jesus Christ. And it was only because Jesus obeyed that we are able to obey today. Because what faith in Christ does is it not only forgives our sins, it gives us a new heart through which we can love, serve, and even obey. Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient, how? From the hearts to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have, been, have become slaves of righteousness. So the freedom that God gives to us is a freedom from sin and the ability to obey from our hearts. You see, the gospel changes the hearts of a person. Because yes, we can obey out of duty. Yes, we can obey out of fear of punishments. But when a life is changed by the gospel, our motives and our methods for obedience, they also change. And so by praying for a yielded heart for your pastors, you are praying for their heart to be transformed by the gospel daily. So that why we do what we do, why we obey, why we serve, why we sacrifice is grounded in and driven by what Jesus has done for us. Not to pay Jesus back as if we could, but to praise Jesus and to thank him for what he's done. So that is an important beginning of our understanding of proper obedience, that it comes truly from a heart that has been transformed through faith by the gospel. And that leads us to our next point as to why we need to pray for a yielded heart and why it is so important. And that is because we obey, when we obey, it reveals it's a heart that trusts the Lord. So everyone repeat, it's a heart that trusts the Lord. For a heart that has been changed by the gospel, one of the reasons we obey is because we trust the God who calls us to follow him. So pray for your pastors to fully trust the Lord as we follow him. A key verse in understanding obedience is seen in the prayer of Jesus before going to the cross. Luke chapter 22, verse 41 and 42. And he says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is a fascinating look at the honesty and the struggle of Jesus before the cross. He says, Father, I do not want to walk this difficult road of suffering and sacrifice. If there's another way, let there be another way. But not my will, let yours be done instead. That is the prayer of obedience. A heart of faith is one that says, even though it's difficult, even though I don't fully know all that's going to happen, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to obey. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when it was called of him to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. God did not give Abraham every part of the plan laid out ahead of time. But that's usually how we want it, right? We'll say, God, I'll follow you as long as you tell me what, everything that's going to happen. As long as you make sure that my plans will work out well, God, I'll follow you. Of course I will, right? But the problem with that is you don't need faith if you know how it's all going to play out in the end. Instead, we need to learn to pray for quick and complete obedience to God's will. God's commands are not given so that we pick and choose which ones to obey. Uh, this is what we're usually like. Okay, God... A worship you on the Lord's Day? Okay, I'll do that, of course, unless I'm on holiday. Okay? Tithe? Um, let me think about that some more. Um, sex only within the marriage covenant? Come on, God, that seems a little bit outdated today, so, uh, okay, next. 
Don't murder? Yes, Lord. I will obey. I will not kill another human being. You are Lord over my life. Of course I will obey you. Don't steal? Okay. Except taxes, right? Since they're really stealing from me first, so... God's commands are not given so that we pick and choose which to obey. That is not lordship. And that heart attitude shows a heart that does not fully trust the Lord. You see, in our faith journey, when God reveals a word for us to obey, obedience to that word or the lack of obedience to it, that becomes our moments of truth to accelerate growth in our faith or to delay it. It becomes a moment of truth. Because how we respond to God's call to obey, it shows what we really believe about God, it shows what we really think about God, whether we really believe He knows what He's doing, if He knows what is best for us, if He is truly all-wise, if I can trust His sovereignty. It shows us what we really think about our God. And it will determine whether we see his mighty work in and through our lives. And it will determine whether we deepen our intimacy with him. So there's a lot at stake when God calls us to obey. It is because he desires to take us on a path towards deeper maturity and intimacy with him. You see, obedience is a sign of a heart that trusts God that we believe he knows what he is doing, that he is loving, kind, and wise, and that he knows what is best for us. If you trust that God is good and that he loves you and that he wants the best for you, you never need to question his word for your life. God's word and his will is always right, always best, and always the path to blessings. Always. Amen? So you can trust him always. Obedience from the hearts is the pathway to blessings. But the problem with obedience is that we know obedience is costly. And we are told to count the cost before we follow Jesus. And we know that obedience can be costly, and so that is why it is so hard to do many times. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, Eddie, I feel God calling me and my family to missions overseas, but, you know, I think my kids also need to live close to their grandparents. I'm not sure about health care. I'm not sure about their education. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep delaying it. I know God wants it, but you know, maybe, maybe later, maybe later. But if God is calling you there, God will care for you there. See, obedience can be costly. One pastor I know baptized a young lady in his congregation who came out of a very strong Buddhist family background. And her dad told her, uh, if you go to church today and leave my house today, go to church to be baptized, don't come home because you will no longer be a part of this family anymore. So she desired to obey even though it would be costly for her. So she went to church that morning, got baptized, and when she returned back home, she found all of her stuff packed up in boxes and in luggage uh, waiting outside the door of her parents' house. She had been kicked out of her home. There is a cost to obedience. So ob obedience can be costly, and we know this very well. And that is why we struggle with it sometimes. But you know what? Disobedience is more costly. It can cost us deeper intimacy with God. It can cost us greater blessings upon our life and our ministry. God desires us to take steps of faith and obedience in order for us to go on a new journey and adventure of seeing his faithfulness released in the places of unknown within our faith journey. And he desires us to experience that as we walk forth boldly with faith and obey him because we trust him. But when we choose not to, it can cost us 
new experiences of seeing His faithfulness. It can cost us growth in our character and our faith. And that is why the enemy wants to keep us off this path of obedience. That is why the temptation so often is to delay obedience or to do partial obedience. Not realizing that both delayed obedience and partial obedience is still disobedience. So the temptation to stay off the obedient path will remain on this side of eternity. But no matter how costly obedience may be for us, even our own lives, disobedience is far more costly. And that is why God wants us to keep trusting Him, that He is good, that He is wise, that He is loving, and that He does care for you. Because He knows that obedience will keep us on the path of blessings and deeper intimacy and encounter with Him. Because a heart that fully trusts the Lord will obey quickly and completely. Pray that for your pastors, that we would be quick and complete in our obedience towards him. Amen? You know, Billy Graham, at the age of 30, was at a crossroads in his life. His good friend and fellow evangelist, Charles Templeton, recently abandoned the beliefs and the faith uh, that Billy Graham and he once shared. They were both rising stars in the church, both doing evangelistic crusades, and both uh, experiencing great success and fruitfulness. Billy Graham at the time, he was a successful college president and a rising evangelist, but the core of his life and his ministry was shaken by the abandonment of his friend's faith. If someone so close to him in the faith could walk away from the Bible, walk away from obedience to Christ, Was he so naive to think that he would be able to keep trusting Christ in the long haul? He writes this, At that night, uh, my heart became heavily burdened. With the L.A. campaign slowly uh, coming up behind me, I had to have an answer. If I could not trust God, if I could not trust the Bible, then I could not go on. I would have to quit the school presidency. I would have to leave pulpit evangelism. I was only 30 years of age. It was not too late to become a dairy farmer. But that night, I believed with all my heart that the God who had saved my soul would never let me go. Oh God, I prayed. There are many things in your book and in my life I do not understand. There are many problems with which I cannot offer a proper solution. But God, today, I fully trust you and your word by faith. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust this Bible that you've given to us completely, even if there are times that I do not fully understand it all. He says, when I got up from my knees that night, my eyes stung with tears. I sensed the presence and power of God in a very special way. Not all of my questions had been answered, but a major bridge had been crossed. In my mind and in my heart, I knew a spiritual battle for my soul had been fought and won. He made a conscious decision from that moment forward. Jesus, I'm going to trust you and your word fully from this day forward. Shortly after that night, he began his L.A. campaign, and from that speaking tour, God propelled him into international prominence and influence. Looking back at that moment, Billy Graham says that God honored him for finally and fully trusting him, no matter what. A heart of obedience is a heart that trusts the Lord. But there's one more element of an obedient heart, and that is, it's a heart that treasures the Lord. So everyone repeat, it's a heart that treasures the Lord. One sign of a heart of obedience is a heart that treasures Christ above all. You see, obedience is a natural overflow of love. When you love someone, you are more than happy to serve them, to obey them. Because you know it makes them happy. John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, says Jesus. 
John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus is repeatedly making a crucial connection between obedience and love. For the life that has found Christ and trusts in him, obedience becomes an issue of love and an expression of love. Henry Blackaby in his book, Experiencing God, says this about this connection. Obedience is the outward expression of your love for God. The reward for obedience is that God will make himself known to you. If you have an obedience problem, you actually have a love problem. Because if you love him, you will obey him. So obedience is not a burden when love is at the heart of a relationship. Because we naturally want to please those that we love. You know, one of my friends, uh, when I was in high school, he had an older brother who went through an extreme rebellious period during jun junior high and high school. Uh, his older brother was in the drug scene, the gang scene, you name it. Uh, he slept around, got his girlfriend pregnant, forced her to have an abortion, and he would come home either really late at night or sometimes he wouldn't come home for days. Uh, their parents were immigrant workers who worked really hard, long hours to provide for their kids, and it broke their heart to see one of their kids going down this path of rebellion. And he would often tell me of how it would break his heart to see his parents crying at nights, uh, wishing that they knew where his older brother was and that he would come home soon. And even though he also wanted his brother to come home soon, whenever his brother was home, the house would be filled with screaming and fighting. Their parents often felt like they failed as parents because of how his brother turned out. But they often expressed they were so thankful that my friend, the younger brother, was at home during this difficult time period. He said that during his older high school days, there were many moments where he also had this urge to rebel, to go out, stay out late, start drinking, or start doing things that he knows maybe he shouldn't do. But he said every time he had the urge to also rebel, he said memories of his mom and dad crying at night stopped him from rebelling. He once told me one time, I just couldn't do it. Because I loved my parents, I just couldn't make them feel like they failed at parenting both of us. So out of love for them, I obeyed. True love obeys. More than loving our own selfish ambitions, he treasured his parents more, which dictated a heart that honored them. And those who treasure Christ above all other people will gladly trust and obey him too. One of our missionaries recently shared, why am I on the mission field? Because Jesus said clearly in the Gospels, go to the nations and make disciples of them. So it is because she loves Jesus, she is on the mission field. And it is because she loves Jesus, she obeys his word. The two go together. And I love this about OEM. We have about six members who are now studying law school throughout the U.S. and in Korea, changing their career directions because of God's call upon their lives to pursue justice for the oppressed because of what God was doing in their lives within the past few years at OEM. They changed the direction of their lives because of obedience to God, because of their love for God. And I love that even many more than that of OEM are now living in Thailand, Cambodia, UK, Kuwait, and many more are in preparation to go abroad to other countries because of what God has called us to do, and that is to go to the nations and make disciples of them. I love the fact that they desire to change the trajectory of their lives because God's word says so. They gave up their dreams and they are now living with a kingdom vision. And that is an expression of love. And our pursuit of justice for our ministry is also out of obedience to God's leading. 
because of our love for him. It wasn't that one day where I was like, oh, yeah, I think human trafficking might be a nice thing to do as a church, so let's do that. It was out of obedience of God's leading that we pursued justice for the orphan, for the single mom, for the trafficker, for the oppressed. We care for the orphan, seeking ways for expats now to care for them, not only as adoptive parents, but as foster parents, and even for the newer opportunities, uh, hopefully finalized later this year, for us as an expat community to be foster parents to North Korean children who are residing in this country as well. And I encourage you to continue to pray and see if you are a part of that plan for your life and God's will for these children as well. We fight for the freedom and restoration of those enslaved in the sex industry of Korea and around the world because God calls us to bring justice to the oppressed. We obey God's word because we love our God. And I'll be honest, there have been people who have told me point blank, hey, Eddie, why don't you just leave our church? On the Korean side, not the EM side. Uh, we're not into this justice stuff that you're doing. So why don't you leave Start your own NGO, and I think everybody will be happy. So um, I had to smile, um, hold my tongue so I don't sin initially. Uh, and I had to say, with all due respect, sir, <clears throat> I came to OEM out of obedience to God, and I will leave uh, if or when God calls me to leave out of obedience to God. Uh, and we have moved into these justice arenas, because God has called us to these places, and I will not leave them because you tell me to. I will only respond to what God calls us to. You see, that is why we need to pray for our pastors to have a yielded heart before God. Because the pressures to please people is strong. But also, the words of criticism and discouragement from others can be even stronger. There was an online study published in the March issue of the Review of Religious Research. They found that 28% of ministers, uh, they said that they had at one time been forced to leave their ministry due to personal attacks and criticism from a small fraction of their congregation members. They were referred to as toxic congregation members. Those who, though they are a small number, use their power, pressure, and influence to push ministers out. And what was also disturbing is they, are, they were finding that these small groups of people who push out their ministers is growing uh, throughout North America. And so we need to pray that our pastors would trust and treasure Christ more than the applause of friends and the arrows of enemies. And that what we do is because we desire to follow him, because we love him. So pray for a heart that is transformed by the gospel daily. Pray for a heart that trusts the Lord so that we will respond quickly and completely. And pray for a heart that treasures Christ more than anything or anyone else, because that is the heart of obedience. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your patience with us, your unceasing love for us, that understands our weakness that understands our fears, that understands that we are but dust. We are scared to follow you sometimes, scared to obey you sometimes. Father, I just want to pray for a strengthening of faith in the hearts of your people here today to be able to trust you into the unknown, into the areas of sacrifice, into the areas of surrender. Pray for hearts 
that we'll be able to trust you no matter what. God, I also pray that as we wrestle with wanting to stay safe, wanting to stay comfortable, and we wrestle with wanting to follow you and wanting to take steps of faith and wanting to grow in our faith, I pray that that wrestling time would end at the foot of the cross where we will hear the echoes of Jesus. God, this is what I want, but not my will. Let yours be done. May that be the prayer of your people today and always. Not our will, God. Let your will be done. In OEM, in our lives, in this nation, and in this generation, as it is in heaven. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory without fault, but with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, sovereignty, and authority before all time. Be trusted, be treasured, now and forever. Amen.